we are joined today by Jamie Oslander, who is a principal at Beverage and Diamond, where he represents numerous major and small businesses, trade associations, and state agencies, and a wide range of regulatory and litigation matters, both national and local in scope. He devotes a significant portion of his practice to counseling and litigation under the National Environmental Policy Act, otherwise known as NEPA, and similar states and is well versed in issues arising under the Endangered Species Act, otherwise known as the ESA. Shiraz Tangri is a partner at Alston and Bird's Environmental and Land Development Group, and he assists clients with the development of real estate, energy, and infrastructure projects. His practice involves all aspects of land use entitlements, compliance, litigation, and lobbying, including the California Environmental Quality Act and NEPA. So with that, I will turn it over to Jamie, and, oh, sorry, over to Shiraz. And we'll Thank get started. He won the coin flip. He did win yeah. the coin flip. Yeah. I think I lost the coin flip. <laughs> um, well, thank you guys all for being here. <clears throat> I uh, now mention my background is I went to law school in D.C. Um, at Georgetown and uh, come back here from time to time for work. And um, I was here in the early mid '90s when D.C. was not a particularly great place to live. It's always nice to be back here and see what a what a great and livable city it is. Um, uh, a note on my background that is uh, somewhat relevant to uh, what we're going to talk about today. Um, a lot of my background, or a lot of the work that I do, is on the litigation side. Um, as you probably gathered, environmental law is a heavily statutory uh, practice, um, and we're going to focus on a couple of statutes today. But actually, a lot of the roots of environmental law come from common law, and before a lot of those statutes were in play, uh, common law through you know, judicial review. Uh, found different ways to handle environmental issues as they were as they were cropping up. Um, and let me just ask you a sense of so who here is a law student? Uh, who, are there practicing lawyers in the audience? And uh, condolences. <laughs> and uh, are are there folks that are more on the engineering and environmental side of things? Okay. Folks on policy side. Doing policy? Okay, um, great. Um, so uh, I'll just say as a kind of a background to the way to what I want to talk about today. First of all, I, I hope it's an, it's a back and forth discussion because I think that's really kind of the best way to learn. Uh, when I went to Georgetown, I had a, a professor whose motto on statutory construction was that there were three rules for for uh, how you interpret statutes: read the statute, read the statute, read the statute. Um, He's probably right. Uh, I didn't like him a whole lot, and it certainly was an incredibly boring way to run a class. So uh, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the nitty gritty of the statute. Chandra mentioned that there are some materials. Um, among, among them, there's a Citizen's Guide to NEPA put out by the uh, Council on Environmental Quality. Um, and that uh, gives a great, I think, orientation for different aspects of the statute. I really wanted to talk more about where NEPA came from how it's evolved, and and um, talk through a couple of case studies of things that I've worked on to give a sense of how it actually applies and, and how you might deal with it in the real world, world of practice, whether you are practicing as an environmental lawyer, um, some other kind of environmental professional, working on the policy side as well. So with, with that sort of background, um, one of the great things about environmental laws are um, they are very much, uh, and NEPA I think exemplifies this. They, they are they are forward-looking laws, right? They are really about, um, with, with some exceptions, um, they are about how do we have a greener and cleaner future, if you want to sort of describe it that way. Uh, and as you can imagine, that was not always a uh, concern that government wraps itself up in or the courts were involved in. Um, but you started to see a lot of activity around environmental issues, or what we now think of as environmental issues, really in the late 1800s and early 1900s, uh, as a result of industrialization and the creation of, of urban cities, as, as we now think of them. Um, my practice is uh, focuses a lot on land use and development, and environmental law is sort of a creature of um, it, it, it sits between the science side, right, understanding uh, technically uh, what happens in the environment when you're talking about different materials mixing, um, exposure to humans, exposure to, to wildlife or soils, et cetera, uh, as well as the policy side of what do we do about those, you know, potential interactions. Uh, when 
in the U.S., and it's true really around the world, but especially in the U.S., as you started to see people living together in large places and starting to have industrial processes, factories, plants, um, uh, manufacturing on a scale, you started to really have the types of conflicts that really have produced environmental loss, right? So as people started to live near leather tanneries, to take an early example, um, they started to notice odor and what we now think of as air quality emissions, right? Um, so some of the early laws that dealt with environmental issues were really focused on nuisance type issues, if you will, right? Smoke, uh, odors, those types of, of issues. And a lot of the early common law is based on kind of earlier tort theories like nuisance and trespass. So for example, when somebody spills some gook on, uh, your, on their land and it comes across onto your land, that's a trespass. That's how the courts would treat that. Um, and believe it or not, some of those more ancient concepts still, uh, they still apply today. A lot of the litigation that goes on, particularly in state court cases, um, you're still looking at those old common law theories, nuisance trespass, continuing trespass, as the potential grounds for a cause of action. Um, and some of the earlier stuff, I, I can remember, and I couldn't remember the name of the case, because it's been a long time since I was in law school, but um, as courts were trying to understand how to treat these violations, right? They would use analogies to, one of the analogies was, you know, a hunter who chases a deer running across people's property. Um, you know, is that deer the property of the land on, uh, does it belong to the landowner who owns the property on which the deer is running at the time? Is it the person who bags and captures it? Um, a big part of the development of environmental law has been answering these questions about you know, who manages these resources, right? Sometimes these resources don't really care about things like property lines, state boundaries, city, county, et cetera. Uh, and that's been one of the interesting challenges on environmental law is you know, how do we determine really who has the liability, the responsibility for dealing with issues that, that cross these boundaries? Uh, and I'll mention as, as just sort of like a career perspective, I, I, I first started working on environmental issues. When I was an undergrad, I, I um, was a law clerk in the county law department where I worked, uh, where, sorry, where I grew up in upstate New York, um, heavily industrial part of the world. And um, many of the municipalities there were dealing with environmental issues for the first time and having to figure out, you know, when they had major water quality issues or air quality issues, dealing with, with uh, solid ways, um, did they have the ability to go after the folks that actually created these issues? Were they stuck as a municipality dealing with the cleanup themselves? Who would pay for it? Um, there are lots of insurance issues that, that come into that as well. So I don't know if there's anything you want to add in terms of historical uh, aspects. Uh, no, and thank you. Um, uh, this is Jamie Osland there. I just want to say thank you to Chandra and Eli and Shiraz for uh, joining me. I, I think uh, we'll have a very informative afternoon and hopefully not leave you guys with your head spinning um especially appreciative for the uh announcement of where the bathrooms are i i i i started um my career uh the same place i am now i'm at beverage and diamond and i first came to these uh, uh these sessions and and really i i found them useful when when old people were sitting up here and um, telling me uh, what what these statues meant, and I was uh, the Clean Water Act one, and I, all I could think about was 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 how how badly I, I, I how how much longer was it going to be over for that to go? But anyway, we have we're talking about we're talking about NEPA and, and ESA today. Um, I, I think that's an excellent history. I I think one of the sad um, and it's especially true today with with the way Congress is today. So one of the, one of the sad realities about human nature is while fully agree that environmental law is intended to be prospective. It's intended to ensure a cleaner world for our children and grandchildren than when, when we took it over. Um, how much of it is reactive uh, in nature? How much of it is actually triggered by the big, big bad event that, that happens? Whether you're talking about um, the Exxon Valdez spill that led to the, uh, to the Oil Pollution Act, you're talking about the Cuyahoga River being on fire, you know, gave, gave way to to the uh, to Circla, I know some of these statutes we're going to be talking about in um, in later um, in later uh, 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 summer school sessions in future weeks. But uh, it, it often takes a lot. And the Deepwater Horizon disaster that that happened in the Gulf, we still have not seen uh, 
uh, a legislative response um, to that. There have been a lot of bills, there have been some regulations, but uh, it's it's often people don't have their eyes open until, oh my God, the smog, I can't breathe outside and I can't drink my water, it's on fire. Um, so it, it's, it's that constant struggle between avoiding the emergency, having a precautionary principle. Climate change, of course, is the core issue of our day. How uh, is it happening? Where? How, how quickly? Why? You know, what should we do to prevent it? You know, should we wait till, you know, the, the two degrees warmer until we have more storms? I mean, it's just the constant pull, um, pull uh, between uh, acting uh, in our own uh, interests and, and uh, re economics and um, living well today and, and uh, trying to predict and prevent against what's going on um, in the future. Uh, one kind of just general thing, and I know lawyers uh, in the room can close their eyes for two minutes, but uh, just the general, we're going to be talking about uh, the statute, which is, you know, of course, passed by Congress as the source of uh, many of the laws, but uh, we're going to be talking about a lot of other different kinds of authority, and just in case no one knows, this is sort of how roughly, and, and do not quote me because I have a lot of <laughs> scholars that are going to contest with me, but of course, everything starts with the Constitution, the, the U.S. Constitution, a great document they signed that sticky summer, uh, 1787. Um, and then pre from that, change, yes, right. exactly, pre-climate change, change, exactly. Um, then the statutes, what Congress passes, uh, and then under the statutes, there often uh, are gaps or uh, issues that Congress didn't contemplate or sometimes Congress punted on. And that goes down to the agencies under the executive branch of the president to to implement and the regulations um, uh, can be issued by uh, any number of agencies. They could be issued by joint agencies, um, but those fall under uh, the, the executive power. So the hierarchy would be constitution, statute, regulations under the statute. The regulations can't contradict the statute. A lot of a lot of different cases, a lot of different contexts where regulations are challenged as being ultra virus, which means they're in excess of the power that Congress gave the agency. Um, and then below regulations, we got a whole mess of, of real amorphous stuff, guidance, um, policy statements, um, uh, certain adjudications um, that uh, happen. So uh, those are not binding because they don't have the force of regulation or statute, but they are, as a practical matter, very important um, for the regulated community and uh, um, in, in guiding how sign of day-to-day -day things um, are going to be are going to be dictated. And then sometimes, we got problems where we have parties that don't agree or there's a, an event and it hasn't been sufficiently remediated or you need an action to do it and the courts uh, the third branch of our government handle that so below regulations we have case law uh, and we'll be talking i think about a few cases the supreme court is obviously the highest court uh, in the country but below that we have circuit courts of appeal um, 11 circuits plus the D, um, plus the federal circuit and then we have state uh, uh, district courts that are um, throughout the country and cases can start at a district court, move up to appeal court, move all the way up to the Supreme Court. Uh, most of them get handled at the district court level, um, but uh, some of our big decisions that set the stage for how things are going to be decided in the future or rules of the game uh, are set um, by the appellate in the Supreme Court. And then of course we have all kinds of state laws, state courts, um, uh, sometimes state courts can find their way to the Supreme Court when there's a big con uh, controversy. Sometimes there's a controversy between a state, let's say over water rights, um, you know, Oklahoma, Texas, um, uh, uh, California, California, and everybody. Uh, there, there are um, uh, those will go uh, all the way directly up to the to the Supreme Court. So, just as you're talking, as you're listening to us again, um, Shiraz is absolutely right. The statute we're going to talk about to NEPA and and the Endangered Species Act, but. You know, just have in the back of your mind that, that we, it's always changing. Regulations are obviously a product of the administration that's in there. We have administrations that are more conscious to green issues, ones that are more focused on uh, on economic issues, uh, and they can they can change. And of course, the guidance, which is sort of out there, can change. And sometimes you don't even know it's changed. So our job as lawyers that keeps us in, in business is to keep our clients apprised of what's going on and what's what's coming down the road. So that's all the intro I have. And I'll, that, that's I'll actually a great jumping off point. For why it works. Okay, um, so starting with NEPA. Um, so why do we? Why start with NEPA? Uh, as you can see, it's uh, often referred to as the Magna Carta of the environment, which is fantastic because it sounds so scholarly, right? Um, Magna Carta. I mean, how often do you even get to say that? <laughs> um, but uh, as Jamie pointed out, there is this hierarchy of laws and 
uh, NEPA was, for the most part, the first major federal act uh, dealing with the environmental, dealing in the environmental realm. There were some prior acts that had environmental consequences, but uh, NEPA was really the, the, the sort of the, the godfather um, of the federal government deciding it wanted to get into the in, in, interregulating environmental issues. Um, and a little bit of historical context about that. So NEPA uh, was, uh, in, on the next slide I'll talk a little bit about the timing, but uh, passed in the late 1960s. Um, the 1960s, obviously, pretty turbulent time in the history of this country, and the civil rights movement. Um, both the civil rights movement and the environmental movement, uh, in, in large part, or, or a lot of what dictated what happened there was modern urbanization, right? In the post-war era, um, you saw a huge migration into cities. You started to see um, uh, issues that I deal with, you know, zoning type issues. Can you put residents next to factories? Um, where can you put freeways and, and highways? Uh, the, the creation of the national highway system actually had a whole lot to do with the development of the environmental laws because suddenly you had access to parts of the country that you never did before. You were going to and through resources that had previously been fairly pristine. And so now you had people worrying about things like, you know, what was happening to our forest land, what was happening to other protected areas, um, our water bodies. Uh, th there was a much uh, higher awareness and access to all those resources. And at the same time, because you had so many more folks living in cities, there were a lot more concerns about the potentials for conflicts of, you know, the different forms of, of, of human behavior and activity. Um, there was a very influential book, and I always forget the year it was published, but in the 1960s, called Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. And if you know, I see a lot of nodding heads. Um, it's a fantastic read. It's still a fantastic read today. But it, it, it sort of it sets the background for what environmental consciousness was in the 1960s. It was about resources disappearing. And you started to have um, words like recycling, conservation, preservation, were uh, you know really uh, starting to come into the forefront as people thought about you know the meadowlands that weren't there anymore and were now replaced by you know, housing developments or um, you know again the, the the national freeway system and the creation of really community awareness of what happens when you have you know significant transportation projects that may benefit the um, you know the sort of the community at large but might have very specific impacts on either people or resources in a, in a particular place. So um, on the context of this, there, Congress started to look at a number of different issues, water, air, et cetera, um, and uh, look at regulating. And NEPA was the, was the brainchild of Scoop Jackson, which is like an incredible name for a congressman. And um, was, and I was just to say this, and like, this may not mean a lot to you, it was, it was not controversial. Um, it, uh, it more or less flew through the House, uh, and the, the kind of the political issues of the time were, you know, one congressman had another environmental bill that was moving and which would come first and those types of issues. But if you, as you sort of sit here, you know, 40 plus years later and you look back at the profound impact that he has had, um, the, the notion that it was a bipartisan bill uh, signed by Republican President Richard Nixon without much thought and um, sort of a very positive signing note about how this would, uh, you know, really modernize America's understanding of the, of the potential for environmental impact. It's, it's really profound to think of how, how our um, views on environmental regulations have changed. Um, this was a bipartisan issue back then, and it didn't seem to be nearly as controversial as, as environmental issues are you know, today and, and have been for many years. Um, NEPA is often referred to as a procedural statute. Uh, and, and we'll talk a little bit about specific provisions, but basically what NEPA requires is that you, uh, that agencies, um, federal agencies, but agencies that are working on projects subject to NEPA have to disclose the potential environmental impacts and allow for public review and debate on that. Now again, thinking a little bit about the historical context, NEPA just preceded Watergate. Um, and, you know, you kids with your crazy Twitter, you're used to uh, you know, everyone discloses everything all the time now voluntarily. Um, in those days, it wasn't the case, right? This is on the back of the era of, we're from the government, trust me. Um, 
So shortly after NEPA's passed, you start to have a whole lot of energy in Congress and around the country focused on transparency, disclosure, the Sunshine Laws, the Freedom of Information Act gets passed, and NEPA rides that wave. Um, NEPA really becomes, on the environmental side, this uh, sort of centralized ability to examine what government is doing, what government actions are doing through the lens of the environment. And uh, it, very novel at its time for doing that. And I think one of the uh, sort of said it wasn't controversial. I don't think anyone understood how those disclosure requirements, you know, um, w would really, uh, why they would have such a profound impact. Uh, Jamie mentioned that states, of course, are also in the environmental business, and, and many of them have been much longer. Right. Um, somewhat of a hodgepodge occasionally. I, I started practicing in New York, as I mentioned, and in New York, uh, a lot of the clean water provisions are embedded in what had been New York's water laws, also known as the navigation law, right? Because there, it was a, a statute originally written to deal with, you know, when boats could get up river and things like that. Um, but that was a place where environmental regulation was embedded into the law, and I remember having a case in front of a very, you know, crusty old judge um, who said, you know, navigation law, what does this case have to do with boats? Uh, none, no, it had nothing to do with boats whatsoever. But that was sort of the hodgepodge of state rules. One of the things that NEPA uh, was, was sort of the first act to do, and then you see it in, with respect to other environmental regulations, is you start to have copycat state regulations that would mirror what the feds do. Uh, now, of course, it, within the federal system, you've got to have consistency um, a lot of the more interesting issues are about when states want to regulate beyond what the feds uh, allow. Um, this has been, California always wants to do something different than everybody else, but particularly in the Clean Air Act context, that's been a big issue of, you know, um, what are the clean air regulations applicable to cars? Can you sell the same car in California that you can sell elsewhere? Right? That's been a, a pretty common thing. So the, the um, state environmental protection acts came into being. There are, I think, roughly about half the states um, plus Guam have some type of environmental disclosure act that's sort of similar to NEPA. Uh, the most notorious is the one that I spend most of my time with, the CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, which is very broad ranging in part because in typical California fashion, um, there's a very low threshold for litigation. California loves to let people litigate and um, often, even when you're working on NEPA projects and you're looking for a precedent in case law, you end up looking at California cases because there are so many cases that get litigated in California over environmental issues. Um, Jimmy mentioned greenhouse gas issues, which, of course, the, the federal government has been engaged in, and, and, and NEPA does have, uh, NEPA documents now do have to look at greenhouse gases. That issue was first litigated in California. One of my cases was the first case in which um, uh, opposition to the project uh, argued that a housing project, a proposed uh, master plan community, had to look at the climate change impacts of developing that community. Pretty novel concept at the time. Um, uh, ultimately, the judge agreed that the law didn't require it at the time, but of course the law has subsequently changed and policy has changed. Um, but you do definitely see an interaction between what's happening on the state side and the federal side. Uh, the other reason, or one of the, the reasons we think of NEPA as the granddaddy is that then you, following NEPA, you started to see so many um, other big federal regulations. I put up a few of them, but there's over a dozen now um, that often were more resource specific, right? So the Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, Endangered Species, all acts focusing on uh, more or less specific regulations. And then, you know, another big game changer that uh, I've spent a good chunk of my career on, and it sounds like Jamie has as well, is Circular or the Superfund Act. Um, Circular is perhaps the most backward looking in the sense that it's about cleaning up existing problems. And at some point in my career, I realized, you know, having worked on a lot of these cases, that uh, I could put myself out of business, right? Because eventually, we should clean up all these old messes and people won't um, continue to, you know, to create Superfund societies in theory. Uh, but, uh, but, it, but, you know, su the, the, Game changing, one of the game changing aspects of CERCLA is it imposed strict liability. And I talked before about how common law theories of you know, nuisance trespass, um, you know, CERCLA sort of cut out the ability to really um, even sort of litigate about those issues and basically said, no, there's strict liability. You have to clean it up. Now it's just a question of, of how. Who, do you, who does it? 
how do you apportion it? And a lot of what the big uh, circle litigation is about is apportionment issues. How do you share the pain, so to speak? Um, NEPA, by contrast, is perhaps the most forward-looking of the environmental laws because uh, when you engage in NEPA is when you are proposing to do something, right? In my practice, that's typically development of projects that are different kinds. I'll talk about a, a few uh, down the road. But <coughs> the, the NEPA may be the first environmental statute that you have to wrestle with anytime you're trying to build something. Um, and then the other statutes will sort of come into play at the permitting stage. So if you're proposing to build a factory of some kind, um, you'll have to deal with NEPA from the, all the aspects of you know, the construction of that facility, the ultimate impacts of operating that facility. Uh, and if you can clear those hurdles, then you get to the point of saying, well, is there a clean water permit allowed or required? Is there a Clean Air, clean air Act permit required? Um, so one of the fun things, uh, one of the reasons I, I practice in this area is I like building stuff. Um, I like cities, I like architecture. If I could draw a, state, a straight line, I'd probably be an architect. Um, but since I can't, this is sort of how I work on those projects. Um, so NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act, uh, to look lawyerly, I've got the statutory site up there. Uh, as mentioned, it was signed in, in, into effect on, my, on January 1, 1970. Um, and there are kind of three key aspects of, of NEPA. You know, one is that, it, it, as the name suggests, it set a national environmental policy. It really said the federal government is in the business of ensuring that uh, its activities and behavior and conduct does not have adverse environmental impacts. Um, and to do that, it created this new requirement for something called an environmental impact statement. And at the time, I think if you, if you uh, kind of look at some of the historical discussion about it, you know, the expectation is, well, you know, you'd spend 10 or 15 pages coming up with, uh, you know, assessing all the environmental impacts or something. That, yeah, that's right. That, that would be your environmental impact statement, you know, one of these. Um, in fact, you know, I have racks in my office, and we probably do too, uh, you know, multi-volume EISs um, that are literally thousands of pages. Um, these days, there's so much data involved and so much analysis that very often we just gather them electronically. Um, because, uh, somewhat ironically, uh, you'd be wasting a whole bunch of paper printing out all the data uh, that, that backs up these very complicated analyses. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and then the third aspect is NEPA establishes the Council on Environmental Quality, right? So that's really the policy side of, of NEPA is um, that body sits and sort of looks globally at what the federal government's doing, what federal policy is. Uh, or how, how the federal government should react to things like developments in understanding climate change. Uh, it's a quick breakdown. So it's Title I that declares what the national environmental policy is. And you look at that statement, requires the federal government to use all practicable means uh, to, to, uh, to create and maintain conditions under which man and nature can exist in productive harmony. Uh, very 60s, you know? Even very 70s, uh, sort of a concept. But uh, again, I don't think anyone realized the profound impact of all practical means. But in the subsequent years, creative and, um, and, and forward thinking lawyers, for the most part, and judges have really used that language to ensure that NEPA's had a fundamental impact on project approval and development. Uh, federal agencies must in incorporate environmental considerations in their planning and decision making. Um, that is, again, commonplace today, right? Every federal agency has an environmental group or division where they have access to people to do that. Same thing on the private sector. Um, you know, every company of any size has folks that uh, deal with the environmental regulations that apply to that business. Very novel at the time. And then the third requirement, the preparation of environmental impact statements. Uh, Assessing environmental impact and alternatives of major federal actions significantly affecting the environment. And I underline and bold that um, because those terms really are, that's what the litigation typically is about, right? Um, and then the second, second uh, title establishes the CEQ. Okay, so what's a major federal action? Um, it's a great, you know, it seems to encompass just about everything. And of course, that's largely how the courts have interpreted it. Uh, for the most part, major federal actions can, can be lumped into three categories. 
a federal agency provides some funding for the project, uh, federal land is involved, or the agency, a federal agency is involved in the approval of the project or permitting of the project. Now, almost any project of a significant size is going to involve some federal permitting, particularly on the species side. Right? Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that every project that involves a federal permit of some kind requires NEPA analysis. But there often is a threshold examination of, you know, is the project, uh, as you sort of add up the sum of its parts and look at the level of federal involvement, you know, is this a NEPA project or not? Does, is NEPA analysis required? And that's certainly one of the issues that lawyers advise on, advise their clients on. Um, one of the interesting issues is, uh, you know, the portion of financing. Um, projects, every project that I have worked on um, that has had a NEPA review has never been a purely federal project. Um, one example is uh, there's a museum project I worked on in Los Angeles. It's about the history of Los Angeles and about the Mexican-American culture, the founding of Los Angeles. Um, it's about a 40, 50 million dollar museum project. Mm -hmm. Uh, that project got about a $500,000 grant from the feds uh, and uh, for you know, some of the research and historical preservation work that was being done. As part of developing the project, as context, the, the project's being developed in the historical center of Los Angeles, right, right around where the city was founded and immediately next door to the first Catholic church uh, in, the, in the city. Uh, and uh, our grounds included the former cemetery of that Catholic of that Catholic Church, a uh, cemetery that had been closed in I, I want to say 1844 or something like that, but it had been long closed, and uh, the record showed that everyone who was buried there was excavated and, and reburied at a at a at another Catholic cemetery. Well, uh, when our guys were out there digging, guess what? Um, they first found a little bone fragment. Uh, and eventually they stopped digging when they found about 120 skeletons. Um, clearly not the best excavation job you've ever seen. Um, uh, one of my first involvements with the project was uh, going to a museum facility that was going to house all this historical material and um, watching guys unload these you know, ancient bones from a truck into the museum. There's no class in law school that talks about anything <laughs> like that. Uh, <laughs> And, and it was spooky. I mean, it really, it was like, you know, midnight at a museum with, like, guys bringing bags in. And then still you see them. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Almost. Uh, but, you know, you watch people, like, drop, like, a skull fragment. Please don't do that. Um, so what's the federal link? $50 million project, $500,000 um, uh, $500, grant. Is that enough to federalize the project? In the Fed's eyes, yep. Um, we made all kinds of arguments. There were no federally, uh, one, one of the critical issues is whether there were Native American, uh, wh whether the bones were of Native American origin or not. But there were no federal Native American tribes involved in the project or um, you know, involved in that area. Um, didn't matter to the feds. Once their grant dollars were in there, they had the ability to come in and control what our review and approval process was to be able to complete that work. Um, and ultimately, just so you know, um, everything was reburied, respectfully reburied, um, by professional archaeologists with the oversight of the Native American community and, and other folks, um, with the feds, you know, putting their very heavy helping hand on our shoulder to make sure we did everything correctly. So um, those are the kinds of things you have to think about. It may seem like a purely local project, but a little bit of federal involvement can really go a long, long way. Um, NEPA typically does not apply to a purely private or a, um, a purely a state action, right? Something that's happening uh, where there are no federal dollars involved. Um, typically, you're not dealing with NEPA, but you may have to deal with the state equivalent. So CEQA, I mentioned in California, uh, CEQA applies to any approval by a government agency in California, state or otherwise, meaning a local agency um, is subject to CEQA. And uh, almost anything bigger than a building permit requires that you go through CEQA analysis. Again, one of the reasons why there's so much litigation in California. Um, the uh, Council on Environmental Quality for, for the policy wonks, you know, this is really the body that looks 
uh, at what are the big policy decisions that need to that should be addressed on NEPA issues. Uh, climate change has been the big driver over the last several years, and um, under Nancy Sutley, the current, I think the title is chair of the CDQ, um, and Angelina, by the way, um, the agency has been providing guidance, or the council has been providing guidance for all federal agencies about how they're supposed to look at uh, greenhouse gas emissions and, and quantize them. Now, it may seem like somewhat of a no-brainer, right? I mean, with the exception of about half of Congress, I think most people understand that climate change issues are real and have to be dealt with. Um, even if you agree with that and, and you're not, uh, you, you don't disagree with the science, the tricky thing is what do you do with that analysis? Greenhouse gas impacts are very different than other types of impacts. So um, when you're talking about traditional air emissions impacts, you look at you know, what's the air basin in which people are affected when you have a smokestack emitting gun. Um, greenhouse gas emissions, the, the consequences could be anywhere in the world. So how do you understand, how would you mitigate the impacts? The fact that you, um, you know, buy carbon credits in a particular location, what does that do to offset, you know, the, the, the proposed impact? Um, it's a very tricky question, and it, it's, it's some part policy, some part science. So. It's an ongoing discussion. Implementing regulations. So th the statute itself has been largely unchanged uh, in its history. Um, there's been some action on the regulatory front. Um, you know, on the legal side, you typically are dealing with the implementing regulations. That's sort of the meat on the bones of, of, the, of, the, uh, of, of the practice of law. Um, I don't think there's anything. Well, it's worth noting that many federal agencies have their own set of NEPA regulations, right? As they look at what their activities are that may have an impact on the environment, they typically have their own standards and practices for how they will do NEPA analysis. And there's a tremendous amount of variation. Um, and, uh, you know, often uh, agencies have their own primary statu statutory mandate. So, historic preservation, for example, the museum example I gave, it was a the, the uh, uh, property was in a National Historic Register district, and so the National Historic Preservation Act came into play, which is the, the, you know, the sort of the primary statute. But every as every aspect of decision making, we had to consider whether there was an environmental consequence and, and how NEPA would apply. In that sure, I would say one other thing on that. I mean, sometimes the that there is, I think, more now. Um, the the term that I've heard, which I really love, is called it's called mission alignment yeah. among the agencies. And um, just for instance, uh, President Obama, just last month or a couple months ago, put out a uh, an infrastructure uh, presidential memorandum that authorized uh, instruction instructed uh, agencies within 60 days to identify ways to. Uh, to streamline the process and make it go faster, and then 120 days to come up with a plan to implement it, and those are going to be rolled out, as Shara said, through you know agency by agency regulation. So I mean, these are you know they they are different and frustratingly so, but uh, well, it, it keeps it, us it, 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 it does <laughs> it does, but they're always changing too. Right. Yeah. So you really you have to look not just at you know the statute and the regulations, but you've got to go to the specific agency and look at their regulations. Um, the NEPA review process, and I'll walk through this a little quickly to make sure we stay on time, but you know, this is sort of the heart of what you do in, in NEPA, and um, there are essentially three levels of analysis. The categorical exclusion, uh, the environmental assessment stage, uh, and then the full-blown environmental impact statement. Now, a lot of the time and attention is spent really on environmental impact statements again because of their size, because that's what gets litigated, because typically when you're dealing with larger, more complicated projects, you're dealing with an EIR, but the vast majority of, um, of NEPA analyses actually result in the other two categories. Uh, I actually have a number up there. So a, a 2010 study found that in 2009, there were 6,300 environmental assessments, that middle category, versus 715 full-blown environmental impact statements, um, and there were 161,000 total NEPA reviews. So. That's a huge number, obviously, in the categorical exclusion, right? Well, why is that? So the number one thing that's excluded is simply passing legislation, right? Every type of legislative act requires at least that initial review of will this new legislation, will the passing of this bill have an environmental impact? In almost all instances, the answer itself is no, even though 
the legislation may anticipate or um, expect that you would, it, it may create the opportunity for projects that would itself, that would themselves require NEPA analysis, right? Does that sort of make sense? So, you know, um, a, a legislative determination that we should streamline uh, the permitting of transportation projects, that would typically be a categorical exclusion, but each of those projects would have its own NEPA analysis that you'd have to go through. So that's sort of why you see so many in that upper level category. I put up this flow chart. It's actually in the materials um, that uh, I think are available on the OIS website um, uh, for a couple reasons. One, um, it's, it's like Byzantine. I mean, you just look at it and the arrows go all over the place. But this really is sort of the, the how you proceed through the statute, right? And you can sort of see the, the on the category out to the left is categorical exclusion. Um, around that, you actually have a, an exemption determination that's even larger. I mean, if you have a specific exemption that takes you out of the NEPA world, right, you get to go straight to go. Um, if you go through categorical exclusion, that's obviously the most streamlined process. Uh, the environmental assessment is sort of in the middle. Uh, but environmental assessment could lead then to doing an environmental impact statement. That's why you see it sort of looping back around. Mm -hmm. um, categorical exclusions are typically defined either in statute or by regulation. I mentioned the largest one, but there are others that are that are specifically um, called out. In any given year, there are usually fifty to seventy thousand NEPA determinations that are in the in the categorical exclusion. Uh, or that are uh, entitled to a categorical exclusion. Um, agencies often have their lists of the types of things that they do that, that uh, are entitled to the exclusions. Um, level two, EA and then FONSI is the, uh, the cute little name. You know how environmental law loves its, its acronyms, right? So FONSI, which you guys probably means nothing, but um, FONSI was a popular character on a show called Happy Days. Does that mean anything to you? Uh, he's a lovely gentleman. I've actually met him a few times. Um, uh, means finding of no significant impact. So the idea here is uh, you're not subject to the category of exclusion. You've got to do some level of, of analysis. As you do your your um, uh, sort of shallow depth uh, evaluation of whether you have environmental impacts, the conclusion is that you won't have any that are potentially significant um, that could not be mitigated to a level of, uh, of less than potentially significant. Hence, the finding of no significant impact. Um, now, as a practical matter, uh, environmental assessments have gotten, like in EISs themselves, have gotten far more complicated. Uh, even though there's sort of a checklist form that you go through, the uh, backup data that goes into that can often be you know, pretty intense. So uh, there's a project I'll, I'll talk about that I'm working on that we determined ultimately was an, was an EA, it was what's necessary. And the, the federal agency said, you know, we think an EA is no longer than a 50-page document. Uh, that seems pretty reasonable. Uh, that said, the appendices to the EA will be a few thousand pages because the technical analyses to come up with those conclusions that we wouldn't have a significant impact still require a fair amount of technical analysis. Okay. Um, and then the last bullet point, right? Sometimes better safe than sorry. Um, sometimes you are better off disclosing and going through the additional procedural disclosure um, of an environmental impact statement. And that's very often what happens when you have a more um, controversial project or a project in, on which you know the issues. It's a close call as to whether or not you have something that's significant. Um, in that project that I just mentioned, even though on the federal side we're doing an EA, it's a, there's a state uh, equivalent, so we are actually doing a full-blown EIR, which is the state equivalent of the EIS, the Environmental Impact Report, that is far more detailed and analytical. So we'll have this little 50-page thing on top of like a several hundred-page thing sitting on top of like a mountain of uh, backup documents. Uh, and then the third is the Environmental Impact Statement. These are, as I've sort of alluded to, they're very technical analyses that go into them. Um, NEPA requires only that you look at environmental issues. I mean, that seems somewhat obvious, but one of the areas that, that uh, you know, continues to be evolving is, you know, uh, things like environmental justice. Um, there, there, are, there are issues that have an environmental aspect, but also have other policy aspects. And it, there's always a, um, 
sort of a gray area as to whether something is truly just an environmental issue. But NEPA is pretty clear that you're not supposed to look at are just the economic issues, right, which often come into deciding whether a project makes sense or doesn't make sense to cost benefit analysis. That's really not a subject for NEPA review. When you get through, so the, the and, and the flow chart described a little bit, um, what NEPA requires, or what, a, what an EIS requires is essentially you prepare a draft document that gets circulated to the public for review, um, and you take those, the, the public is entitled to provide comments um, on you know, the potential impacts, the potential mitigation that's proposed for the project, and then the agency has to take uh, essentially both sides of that equation. They've got to take the, the environmental analysis itself, weigh that with the comments that have been received, and decide ultimately you know, whether or not they want to move forward with the project. That's sort of the whole point of, of NEPA, is forcing the agency, before it makes its decision, to ensure that it's fully informed and it has disclosure as to the potential environmental hazards, impacts, <laughs> et cetera, of what it is that it's proposing to do. Uh, and if you win that battle, uh, the federal agency memorializes its decision in, in the RAW, the Record of Decision. The Record of Decision is essentially the final stage in the uh, NEPA review process. Um, and one of the issues, of course, that has to be looked at in any EIS is alternatives to the project, right? You can't simply say, here's the project and here's what it's going to do, um, you know, here are the environmental impacts of that you have to come up with other feasible alternatives to achieving the same goal as the project, right? So if you have a transportation project that proposes, for example, a rail system, um, you, a feasible alternative may be a non-rail system, you know, using other types of motor vehicles. Um, Ponies. Ponies is always uh, on the table. Um, <laughs> or looking at an alternative route, right? So instead of going through, uh, you know, road X, maybe you look at road Y as an alternative. The development of alternatives is one of the most, um, I would say, time-consuming, but you know, it's one of the key issues in evaluating uh, any project under NEPA. Judicial review. So you know, here's where many of us make our money. Um, some of us make our money. Um, NEPA itself does not have does not have its own um, uh, citizen action provision. So lawsuits are brought under the Administrative Procedure Act. Typically. Um, Standing requirements are, are quite low, and that's that's also been a source of, of controversy. But um, what that's enabled is environmental justice organizations, um, groups like NRDC, Nat Nat Natural Resources Defense Council, um, the Sierra Club, um, World Wildlife Fund, uh, you know, organizations that may have a global or national scope in what they're looking at may nonetheless be interested in a particular project, and typically you can find ways to meet the thresholds to bring these lawsuits. Um, you can also have lawsuits brought by purely local organizations, and um, uh, while they do have to show that there's an environmental nexus, another challenging area is that, of course, you know, somebody can use the litigation to try and slow down or stop a project, really regardless of whatever their motivation is, you know, whether they care about the environmental issues or not. Um, one of the challenging things about NEPA is historically it's there's been a six year statute of limitations. So if you can imagine, you go through the lengthy process of getting your project approved, and you want to build your bridge or you know road, etc. Um, and for six years, you have the potential threat that somebody's going to file a lawsuit and go to court and say you got to stop construction or you got to rip it down. Right. Um, one of the very troubling aspects of, of NEPA. Um, the federal government has tried to reduce that threshold for transportation projects as a way to incentivize infrastructure development. So that statute is down, or the statute of limitations is down to 180 days. Uh, important note, the action is, is filed against the federal agency, and historically the project developer, if the, if the developer is somebody other than the agency, may not have any role in defending that litigation. Um, so what does that mean? If the agency passed the approval, it should defend its its uh, project, right? Well, the, the entity that has the, the primary interest in making sure that the project can move forward is whoever it is that's going to develop it. Sometimes that's a private sector body, sometimes it's a different public agency. Um, as one example, uh, one of my projects I'll talk about a little bit um, is, uh, it's, a, it's a project in which it's, there's a highway aspect of the project. So the Federal Highway Administration is the federal agency that has 
some approving and funding aspects of the project, and that's why they're involved. Well, the Federal Highway Administration, their lawyers, the Department of Justice, looks at, you know, how they, uh, if, if the rules and, and, and uh, policies all around the country, uh, very different than my client who's interested only in building this particular bridge and highway pro project in one part of the country. Uh, you know, very different level of analysis and uh, how these cases get defended really often depends on who gets to defend them. California recently, I want to say two years ago, lowered that threshold and started to allow greater involvement by the so-called real party in interest, the, the, the developer of the project. Um, typically there are, in the history of, of NEPA, there are typically less than 100 NEPA lawsuits filed a year. Um, that's not a huge amount when you look at particularly other you know, federal statutes, uh, but they very often are about some of the, you know, the largest, most consequential projects, and so that's why you, you tend to get a lot of attention around NEPA litigation. So uh, I've got a couple of minutes and I'll walk through the, the case studies just to show you how these play out. Anybody recognize that bridge? You probably wouldn't. It's a weird looking thing. Um, have you seen the movie Inception? The car falls off the bridge into the water to wake guys up or whatever the thing. That's the bridge. That's what they're talking about. Um, it's a seismically deficient bridge. So the project here was, uh, and you can sort of see, the bridge crosses from um, the uh, sort of you know, mainland of the South Bay to the creatively named Terminal Island. Terminal Island is where a lot of the container terminals in the Port of Los Angeles are located. Uh, it's where ships bring in, um, if, you, if you take the ports of LA and Long Beach together, about 40% of the goods that come into the US come in through those two ports. Um, and you know, stuff goes from there all the way to uh, you know, basically east of the Mississippi in some cases. It's an enormous, enormous port complex. Um, and there's a huge amount of goods that have to go from the terminal onto the mainland. So the proposal, the project here was to replace the seismically deficient bridge uh, and also to build an expressway that would connect the, the terminal um, to the freeway system, as opposed to the current situation where essentially this road that comes off of it, it's a state, it's a state road, um, State Road 47, that um, is a local road. So what you have are trucks hauling these containers that are stopping at stoplights, stop signs, and at railroad crossings. Um, through a residential neighborhood. So the idea of the project was it's a congestion relieving project. It essentially accelerates the movement of goods from the terminal island um, into the freeway system to go you know, wherever, wherever the goods go um, and to avoid the congestion and the air quality impacts that result when you have trucks that are you know, stalling in front of people's homes as they go from you know, uh, one stop sign to another. Um, the developer in this case is it's the Alameda Corridor Transportation Authority. That's a joint powers authority that's created by local governments, the city of Long Beach and the city of Los Angeles. But it's a separate entity. And uh, the entity was created essentially to build infrastructure projects that serve that port complex. The first major project that they build is the Alameda Corridor itself, which is essentially a trench project that gets uh, all these trucks off of the main roads, away from you know, people's homes, it's a um, $2.4 billion corridor that is often referred to as the biggest infrastructure project in the country, although I, that must mean by linear mile, because there's probably more concrete in the Hoover Dam, I'm guessing. Uh, yeah, yeah, big dig in the sense. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's possible. Right. It may have been caught up. Um, Every lawyer, everybody wants to say theirs is the biggest. It's the biggest. Yeah, yeah. That's right. There's a lot of that going around. It's just in the law, though, for nobody else. <laughs> that's right. Um, but, you know, it's, it's so, uh, the, the, Typically, you see NEPA involvement in you know very large projects like that that have, obviously, since you've got goods movement affecting the entire country, I think the federal application is relatively straightforward. It's a even though it's a state road, um, there is some federal funding involved, and therefore you've got the um, that's the federal link for the process. Um, for that bridge replacement process, uh, the environmental review process took about almost eight years from the time the project was conceived. And part of that was, of course, the project change. Are we just building a bridge? Are we doing an expressway? How do they work together? And uh, ultimately, once the, the uh, project was approved after that eight years, 
uh, we spent the last couple of years in litigation. We've actually been able to move through the state court system much faster than through the federal system. But I uh, have just completed literally a week ago the briefing in the Ninth Circuit as to what happens with that project. Um, the issues, and this sort of shows you, um, you know, the kind of nuts and bolts of how this, how these these issues come to a head. Um, as I said, it's a con it was visualized as a congestion relieving project. It's part of our regional transportation plan for how goods get moved uh, through this through the the district. Um, but it was challenged based on air quality issues, uh, air quality impacts, potential greenhouse gas analysis, whether the methodology that the agencies chose to do, uh, meaning how they went about analyzing the greenhouse gas impact, um, was the best methodology or whether somebody else, what, you know, whether uh, methods proposed by other scientists was really the way to, to analyze this. Uh, so far, we've been, um, every court has agreed with, with the way that we've done our analysis, but really until you get to um, until the litigation is resolved, no one's building, you know, no one's going to sink millions of dollars into building a, an infrastructure project um, that could always be reversed by the courts. Um, this is another kind of fun little project that I'm working on, little by, you know, to those sort of big infrastructure uh, proposals. It's a $125 million streetcar project proposed for Los Angeles. I know DC is working on its own streetcar project um, in a very interesting way. I think ours is a much more straightforward one, um, but you look at it, it's a four mile project in downtown Los Angeles, um, 125 million wouldn't seem to hit the federal radar, but uh, we're hoping to get federal dollars into the project. So whether we, we do or don't, we know that a prerequisite is that we have to go through NEPA analysis, and that's the stage that we're, that we're currently going through. Um, even though the project ultimately will be owned and operated by the city and funded in part by local taxes. Um, it just shows you that really, if the feds have any slice of the pie, you're likely in the, in the NEPA world. So. And I think with that, I'll, I don't know if there's anything else you want to say about NEPA. I'm happy uh, to take questions. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll talk about NEPA a little bit, but let's, this is a good time to stop. Um, anybody, questions about the NEPA? Or and as they spring, while I'm talking, you can raise them too, but any questions? On the phone? Oh, okay. All right. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, you, had, you had on your slide that when they have a finding of no what a significant, significant impact. impact, there still might be requirements to um, mitigate potential impacts. But then on another slide, it said that when there is, um, when there are, when there may be potential impacts, you have to do an EIS. So can you tell me what sure. the difference is between those two? So, uh, so the question was, um, if, if you're looking at the three types of NEPA analysis, the, the, the middle one in environmental assessment uh, is an, it's an evaluation of whether you may have environment, significant environmental impacts. Um, how do you, and I think what you're asking is how do you determine when you, when, when an environmental assessment is sufficient or when you have to determine whether you need an environmental impact statement, the full-blown lengthy document. So um, the kind of quick way to answer that is if you know for sure that there will be potentially significant impacts, meaning ones that you can't mitigate, you, then you absolutely have to do an environmental impact statement. If you're going to fall um, in a category where a project will definitely uh, have some impacts, but they can certainly be mitigated, um, some you know mitigation is any technique that you could apply to reduce the environmental impacts. As one example, um, it, we talked about air quality, right? Air quality is obviously a major concern. Um, but there are a number of technologies that are very commonplace and used to limit air emissions. And those are often wholesale incorporated by, by agencies into a project. It's, it is assumed and made a project requirement that you will do you know, X, Y, and Z, imply best available control technologies, and you know, um, use certain types of equipment um, to limit those impacts. And if by doing so you fall within the thresholds of what's considered significant, then you may fall within an environmental assessment. Um, but as, as mentioned, you know, it's really, ultimately, it's up to the agency to determine which pathway it wants to go down. And the agency may decide when, when whether it's, you know, because it's controversial, because it's a close call, 
that they would rather do the full-blown, um, you know, more involved statement. Uh, a lot of times the technical analysis is, is exactly the same. But on the EIS, there's additional public review and, and input. And that provides an additional layer when you get to the judicial review stage. There's an additional level of protection there that you have essentially vetted that project. Because again, NEPA, the whole idea is disclose and discuss, right? So the more disclose and discuss you do, typically the better you are in the eyes of the courts. And the only thing I'd add to that is there, there are different kinds of mitigation. So, you know, as Shiraz is saying, sometimes it, it's, it's, it's the Tappan Zee Bridge. Uh, that just got built without any litigation and it's just it's underway and amazingly there's no litigation so you know sometimes he actually works but um sometimes it's going to be a big project there's going to be significant effects and as part of the environmental impact statement there will be mitigation to which you'll have to commit and uh, one of the there was just guidance issued um recently to make it uh there's a phenomenon called paper mitigation where everybody would say yeah you know we'll, we'll, we'll look and if there's a problem we'll fix it but then there's no money or the project's already underway so the mitigation never really actually happens so there's now more of a i think if there's going to be a substantive component of nepa it's be it's been on the mitigation side but sometimes there is mitigation that you can get out of the eis so for instance we're going to have a significant impact but we can if we implement you know these two measures if we have this um, if we're building a project but we have this uh, uh, dust control and we um, you know have uh, you know green berms uh, you know going through uh, uh, the mediums then um, we may not know we, we may no longer have significant impacts and we can get into an EA and that's called a mitigated FONSI and and uh, you have to do that mitigation to be under the EA if you do the EA and the mitigation doesn't happen you could be put into an EIS and start all over again so uh, you know, mitigation is a very sensitive topic, and if you're going to commit to it, especially to do an EA instead of an EIS, uh, you better be serious about it. Hi, uh, thank you. I have a question about um, how um, compliance with, with NEPA might uh, play out when you're looking at the development of a project. So. If it's a small streetcar project or a small infrastructural improvement, um, would you look at, say, avoiding trying to seek federal funding because then you'd know that it would trigger a NEPA review, which would cost money and introduce risk? And you know, how do you manage, as an attorney advising your client, how do you manage um, both the money aspect, of the spending that you, you know, and financing that you'd have to uh, be seeking and potentially avoiding, but also the risk side of that of what do we risk by seeking federal funding? What do we risk by having a project that um, does this instead of that? Um, and, and how you sort of uh, address that with your clients? That, that's a great question. So the question was, um, in advising clients on, on you know, environmental review issues, um, is, I think, do you advise on the risks that come with Entering into you know the environmental review process essentially and um, potentially look for ways to avoid that that level of review. Um, it, it that's absolutely a big part of the role that, that you play. Um, and, and you know lawyers generally we don't talk about it much in law school, but risk management is a huge part of you know what we do for clients. Um, in California, you've got to balance the risk of you're you're almost always going to have the California review requirements CEQA. Uh, but but they can be sometimes more onerous and sometimes less onerous um, in the sense that um, the actual review process under CEQA tends to be more intense than the NEPA process. Uh, on the other hand, the litigation risk can, can sometimes be better managed because in California there are specialized courts, um, there are judges that, that focus on CEQA, they're supposed to be CEQA experts, and you get through those. So um, I mentioned the, the Alameda Corridor project. That's a $700 million project, and we litigated the um, state court trial, went from filing the complaint to um, having a judgment in our favor in about 14 months, something like that. Um, <clears throat> I'm pretty sure there's no other area of law where you would even litigate a $700 million case. You would typically settle it um, as opposed to taking it to, to trial. Um, but because we have that process in place, you know, you can really advise your clients on what that timing is likely to be and what the potential risks are of doing that. Um, on the other hand, the, the federal litigation on the NEPA document has dragged out much longer because the federal courts don't have the same level of acceleration. And so, you know, two years after, a year and a half after, we're through the Court of Appeal on the state side, we're still in the Ninth Circuit 
you know, on the federal side. So those very much do factor into your client discussions about, you know, and, and it's not always the litigation risk, right? Sometimes it's simply the public debate risk. Um, when you take the federal dollar, um, you know, it, you bring a lot of things with it, and that's that's. I mean, I yeah, say that's well always said. a big part of that's what well we're said. advising clients. Yeah, that's well said. And so sometimes you you don't have the luxury of the choice. Sometimes you have you know you're. you're you got to fill a wetland. You need an Army Corps permit. Sometimes you, um, and, and it's just unavoidable. I mean, so I, I'd say, less often, am I advising clients on how to avoid a NEPA trigger? Um, but where it, where it does come in is is where you can build the project a little bit smarter on the front end. I mean, I think one of the things in the recent reauthorization, I think we both do some ter some transportation, um, is 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 linking the planning and the and the NEPA processes together. And so, if if I can if I can build my road and avoid public lands, if I can avoid the critical habitat of um, I mean, really the Keystone Pipeline right now. I mean, they're trying to see how can we snake it around the aquifer and this and the to 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 avoid the areas of consequence. Maybe it won't affect the NEPA trigger, but it'll affect the scope uh, of what I need to analyze under it. So and what uh, you have to do to mitigate exactly, and what I have to do to mitigate it. So I mean, if you're thinking up front, early engagement, um, not to avoid it, but to to try to make it a manageable process for you before everybody starts, you know, pouncing in, it just becomes a gobbledygook of um, and you're in court for five years. Uh, it, it, it's a good question. It's something we struggle with. Yeah. Another question. Yeah. Hi, I was just going to ask. Uh, the so the statute was passed in '70, and the implementing regs didn't come out till '78. Um, eight years is a pretty long amount of time, even by Fed standards. Um, was there a significant change in thought? You have a couple administrations during that period. Was there a significant change in thought that occurred sort of from the non-controversial passage of NEPA to the time when the implementing regs went into effect, where maybe some of this, you know, garnered a lot of attention? I was wondering if you could speak to that. Sure. So the, the question was, you know, from the passage in 1970 of, the, of NEPA itself to the passage of regulations in 1978, was there sort of change in you know how people looked at the statute and, and its consequences? And I think the answer is yes. I, I mentioned you know what happened in Washington had a whole lot to do with transparency and disclosure, um, but it was also but you know separate from that I think generally living with the statute and having creative lawyers um, and, and having this growing environmental movement that really wanted to use NEPA as a you know. Uh, some people call it a sword or a shield, but you know, to really use it as a forum for um, bringing environmental issues and, and agency consequences to light. Um, a lot of that happened in those early days, and, and the, you know, court decisions at the time also very much were in favor of allowing for robust review. Um, you know, really requiring agencies to um, meaningfully engage with the public, and that's part of what changed. And I think that's part of what took so long for the regulations to develop. The other aspect of, of developing those regulations is, you know, um, I, I mentioned the other federal statutes that, that came out. When you're looking at environmental, when you're doing your environmental analysis, you're looking often at areas that are subject to other regulations, right? Um, and one of the always kind of interesting dynamics is, you know, you're building a project, you're proposing a project, you do an analysis, and you look at, you know, the, whether you have impacts. Um, under how the Clean Air Act would define what a significant impact is. And um, because it's NEPA, it's separate from the Clean Air Act, they're still subject to debate as to whether just satisfying the federal act uh, you know, for the resource is enough to satisfy all of your mitigation requirements. So then that's an ongoing dialogue as well. And often, I think creative lawyers have, have argued that you know, NEPA can be used to require something beyond what simply the, you know, the kind of overarching uh, federal statute would require for a particular impact. So, do you want to add anything? No, thanks, well said. Great. If you move over to something completely different, <laughs> um, I, I think it, you know I've been to um, and spoken on, on panels that are about three or four, four days uh, on NEPA on on every and and I think Shraz did a fantastic job really capturing the essence of it. I mean, it really is a case by case project by project application of the statute. So, you know, you, your employers, your colleagues, just, you know, call Shiraz, call me if you have, you know, you have a question, um, and we're, we'd be happy to, happy to talk to you about it. Okay, I uh, one little close. Yeah, and let me you know, as I was sort of looking at, 
looking at different resources I thought would be useful, I actually found this is a, a publication that the ELI contributed to called NEPA Success Stories. It's a couple of years mm -hmm. old, but it's great because it actually it talks about specific projects and how NEPA played into them um, all around the country. And I thought it was a great way yeah. of really, you know, looking at and again focusing on the success side of um, you know how NEPA was used to shape shape projects. Uh, either through litigation or through the public disclosure process. So um, I'm sure, you know, Google it and you can find it. NEPA success stories. <laughs> Thanks. NEPA success at the same time. Wow. Um, <laughs> it can be done. Um, all right. Well, let's, let's, let's talk about something completely different in the Endangered Species Act. Another statute that came after NEPA um, uh, three years later. And a lot of my work is... Uh, kind of at the intersection of, uh, of, of NEPA and the ESA. Now, in a nutshell, uh, ESA, its purpose is to pr protect and recover uh, imperiled species and the ecosystems on which they depend. And that's a mouthful, and we're going to try to break that down. But unlike NEPA, it is a substantive statute. It is intended to preserve species and their habitats, and it can be a major, major stopper um, uh, if it rears its head. Uh, I think your your program brochure calls calls the ESA the, the pit bull uh, of environmental law. And I, I, not an yeah, that's that's what I thought. I, you know, that was the first thing that came to my mind. You know, pit bull, that doesn't sound right. Let's how about let's call it a you know a, a giant panda of of environmental law. Um, you know, looks real real cute on the outside, but you know, when it when it sits on you it's 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 over. Um so with, with with that in mind, let's 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 dissect this panda a little bit. Uh, that that is uh, my attempt at lawyerly uh, 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 site. It is at um, Title 16 and very short act uh, relative to other environmental laws. There's not many provisions of it, um, but it it is. I don't know. It, it might be one of the most inanely written statutes. Uh, it's very compact, but there's a lot in there and a lot of ambiguity. There are two main um, agencies that implement uh, NEPA, uh, NEPA, the uh, Endangered Species Act. One you can easily think of as on land, and the other one's in the water. One is the Fish and Wildlife Service, which is most often the one you're going to deal with, and that's in the Department of the Interior for land and for freshwater species. And then there's the National Marine Fisheries Service, or NOAA Fisheries, which are uh, deal with with marine and adromedous species. There was there was a comment Obama made about you know saltwater and freshwater fish, and so that kind of getting at that, but that's how we uh, that's how we regulate it there in separate departments, not alone separate agencies. Um, I think a, a very good theme that Shiraz pointed on um, earlier was was how bipartisan this was. Uh, how many just a show of hands, how many people think, you know, there were in, in Congress there were obviously passed, there were a hundred votes against uh, against the ESA when it passed. How, how about lower? Maybe think think more more than a hundred. How about how about more than fifty? How about how about more than twenty? How about more than ten? No, <laughs> okay, four, four no votes in the House. It passed by the uh, Senate by voice vote, three hundred fifty-five to four in the House of Representatives. That's just incredible. Let that sink in. No way this thing gets passed today, but this is what we're working with now. Nothing, it's also, gets, passed today. nothing gets passed today, and it's also one of the reasons why this thing hasn't been amended substantially since. Uh, uh, since 1988. There have been a few um, amendments we're going to talk to to kind of make it a little bit more user friendly, but uh, there haven't been any major amendments to ESA or any of our major environmental laws um, since the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, one kind of note, the, the authorization for the Endangered Species Act actually expired in 1992. That means it was authorized from 1973 to 1992, then the funding cut off. Why is it still going today? Because there's been annual appropriations that fund the uh, work of the Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Marine Fisheries Service. But um, that's what we're working under now. Uh, this is just one of the regions, uh, one of the agencies, and it's split into regions like a lot of um, agencies in our country are. It's, it's purely by uh, geographic. I'd say Fish and Wildlife is one of the more uh, bottom-up uh, agencies. You can have very different experience from one field office to the next field office. Um, there's a lot of God complex uh, that happens because they are they know the species in their area, they're experts in the area, they're um, the expert biologists, PhDs, and so it's very difficult. Sometimes you'll hear a message from one 
uh, from one office to translate that to another office. Sometimes you have to go to a regional level. Sometimes you have to go to a DC level, especially if it's an issue that's that um, uh, crosses a lot of different areas. But um, you know, a, a lot of people it takes a lot of patience um, to get to the um, to get to an understanding. And mostly, while though there are different types of species, Fish and Wildlife and National Marine uh, Fish, uh, Marine Fisheries Service. Uh, have issued joint regulations for ESA. Unless I note otherwise, you can take what I'm saying as, as applying to both agencies. Damn fish. So you can't talk about the ESA without starting with this little fella. Um, anyone who doesn't uh, recognize it immediately, uh, this is a snail darter. You can see how big it is next to the paper clip in the guy's hand. It's a tiny species of fish. It's found in, in Tennessee, and it was listed as endangered in the 1970s, right after um, the Endangered Species Act was passed. This really was the first test of the act. And there was a dam called the Teleco Dam that was planned by the Tennessee Valley Authority. And basically, it would have dammed up uh, the river that this uh, species uh, relied upon, and it would have um, basically cost its habitat and resulted in the destruction of the population. Uh, this dispute made it all the way up uh, to the Supreme Court. And in a very kind of straightforward decision, it said the plain intent of the law was to save all species, whatever the cost. And so this, the dam was stopped. Now, a little epilogue here, it was muscled through by a congressional rider uh, a few years later. Um, so ultimately it, it, um, it passed. And then happily, they found other populations of the snail darter in other parts of, of the river, and it's currently a threatened species, no longer endangered. But uh, it's just that was a very stark, and t the, the case is called TVA v. Hill, and you'll see that in any um, discussion of the Endangered Species Act. But let's talk a little bit about what that all means legally. Uh, Four main areas of the Endangered Species Act we're going to talk about, um, just out of sense before you guys nod off. First, uh, it, it prohibits the unauthorized taking okay, of threatened or endangered species or destroying or adversely modifying their designated critical habitat. So the species that are listed and their habitat are protected. You cannot endanger, you cannot take them. You, you, cannot, uh, um, you cannot mess with them uh, or where they live. Uh, Section seven, um, uh, you must ensure in all circumstances that any federal agency action is not likely to jeopardize the continued existence of any threatened or endangered species act or result in destruction or adverse modification of their critical habitat. So uh, once it's listed under section four, under section seven, you cannot jeopardize it. Uh, any federal action must examine whether it's going to whether uh, whether jeopardy is going to happen, and that's called a consultation process that happens with Fish and Wildlife or National Marine Fisheries Service, the expert species agencies. And then finally, um, it, it 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 prohibits. Uh, we are talking about Section I prohibits take. It's Section 10, uh, which is the later amendments. It allows certain ways around it. So yes, you can't take them, but if you do certain things that on balance are going to help the species, uh, you can uh, build your project and have minimal impacts on the species. So, section four, how do we list these things? Where do they come from? They can be two different ways. One, agency can do it directly, and that happened a lot at the beginning, but it doesn't happen very much anymore. Second is response to petitions, and you have a lot of, um, there could be any citizen, often now there are um, specialized NGOs, Conservation uh, Center for Biological Diversity is one, um, that routinely file petitions to list a particular species. The agencies can act in three ways on a petition. One, they can find that listing is unwarranted. Two, they can find it's warranted, and we have to proceed with listing. And three, they can find it's warranted, but we got better things to do. And so that's basically a warranted but precluded um, is the parlance there. And you can list as two different things. One is endangered, which means, yeah, this thing is pretty close to the brink on extinction. And threaten, it's likely to become endangered. So it's a step down, but we don't want it to become endangered. We're going to act now. Um, listing factors, uh, there's there's five, and I'll just go through quickly. I mean, if there's present or threatened destruction, modification of the habitat. There's overutilization um, of the species or its habitat for various purposes. It's declining due to disease or predation. Um, there's inadequacy of existing regulations, or there's other some natural and man-made factors that affect its continued existence. Key thing with listing, no economic factors, completely biological determination. If it's going to be really expensive. We don't really want to stop these projects. That doesn't play into the listing decision.
listing is purely a biological decision. Now, um, I have under, uh, uh, under threatened Section 4D rules, when you list a threatened species, you also list rules to prevent it from becoming endangered, and that's basically what Section 4D rules are. Um, we also designate critical habitat, and this in a way almost becomes more controversial because not only is the species going to be protected, but where it lives. So as we're going to get to later on, there are certain species that live out west where there's a lot of mining, oil and gas development, and they have big swaths of sagebrush, plains uh, area where they live. That, depending on how you designate the critical habitat, you cannot build typically in those areas. You can't affect where they might live as well as the, the species itself. So uh, designation of critical habitat is a, um, uh, is, is a very important and growing uh, uh, issue that goes along with the species itself. And uh, recovery plans. So the first goal is to prevent extinction, but ESA is also concerned with recovery uh, of the species. So it's not just supposed to end up on the list and remain on the list. The agency is supposed to take steps in cooperation with landowners to prevent and promote the recovery of the species. Uh, these are basically non-binding plans, but they're intended to, for, uh, to help the species propagate and reestablish um, some, if not all, of its own terrain. Uh, Delisting sometimes does happen. Uh, for example, the bald eagle. A lot of people think it's still listed, but it's not. Um, it was delisted, the, uh, um, uh, and that was a result of the protection of the Endangered Species Act, as well as another statute, the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act. All right, so we have a listed species. What happens? Section 7 talks to consultation, requires an agency action. Again, sort of similar parlance to what we're talking about with NEPA. Uh, if the agency's thinking about doing something, it has to stop and think. And here, it doesn't have to just stop and think, but it also has to consult with the expert species agencies, Fish and Wildlife and National Marine Species Service. Um, it requires the consultation to ensure that any action authorized, funded, again, really, really broad, carried out by any agency, the key term is not likely to jeopardize the continued existence of any endangered or threatened species, one, or result in destruction or adverse modification of the critical habitat of such species. In doing that, you have to use the best scientific and commercial data available. Can't be on a whim. You got to support your decision. A lot of litigation is whether the decision and the consultation was based on the best data available. Um, there is a uh, guidance specifically which you can look at. It's called the Section 7 Handbook. Um, it hasn't been updated since 1998, but the agencies still use this to guide consultations. There are uh, a couple different ways we can go about it. And there's a threshold issue. One, do we have a species in our area? I want to build a project. I want to build a mine. I want to build a road. Okay, is there a species in my area? Or do I have critical habitat in my area? No? Go ahead. You can keep, you can go with your project. Do I have them? Do I have a species or habitat in my area, but I'm not going to impact it at all? No effect at all. If that's true, you can also go on. So no effect determination terminates. Uh, your Section 7 responsibilities. However, no effect is pretty hard to get to. May affect, the courts have held that may affect can be very, very low threshold. It could be any possible effect. It can even be a beneficial impact on the species overall, can get you into consultation. So let's say we're in the more uh, the next onerous area, may affect, but not likely to adversely affect. And that triggers an informal consultation to look at basically whether we're going to have adverse effects or not. And the action agency prepares what's called an, a biological assessment. This is the agency, the DOT, um, the Army Corps, the agency that wants to do the action, not Fish and Wildlife. The agency that wants to do the action will do a biological assessment where it will look and basically see if there's going to be adverse impacts on the species and it issues a determination. It sends its determination and its BA over to Fish and Wildlife and asks for concurrence. And if there's concurrence that there's not going to be a likely to adversely affect the species, then you may go ahead and your Section 7 is over. However, if the agency disagrees, or if it's just so clear we're going to have impacts that are just unavoidable, we're going to have a likely to adversely affect and we have to go to a formal consultation. And under formal consultation, you would give your biological assessment to the action agent, to the Fish and Wildlife, and then they would develop what's called a biop or a biological opinion. And this is, the, this is the actual agency action where they're going to look and basically the expert agency is going to decide whether there's going to be 
uh, adverse, uh, whether there's going to be jeopardy. So now we know there's going to be adverse impacts. Is there going to be jeopardy? And the biop ha has to look at summary of information on which the opinion is based. It, it has to contain a detailed discussion of the effects of your action on listed species. It has to include the fish and wildlife's opinion on whether the action is likely to jeopardize. Okay, so if there's going to be jeopardy, you're done. Can't, can't undertake the project. Unless <laughs> there is a very, very seldom exception where Congress can legislate your project. That's trying to happen right now with Keystone XL. You see all the um, legislation there. Or uh, there is a, an ad hoc environmental species committee that's made up of executive branch officials and one state member um, where this committee can basically exempt your project from the ESA if it's just so damn important that you have the project and we don't, you know, we know it's going to endanger the species. Um, we know it's going to have, uh, it's going to jeopardize the species. We can go forward with it. Very, very rare that that happens. Basically, jeopardy is a death wish. Um, however, if you find out there's not going to be jeopardy, but we're going to have adverse impacts, you're not done. You have to undertake what, what's called reasonable and prudent measures to mitigate those adverse impacts. And the agency will issue itself or the action agency a, a incidental take statement, which basically says we know there's going to be take of the species. It's going to be incidental. It's going to adversely affect, but it's not going to you know, throw the species over the cliff. And basically, by issuing the incidental take statement, if you comply with those terms, you won't have liability under the next section that we're going to talk about, which is the take prohibition, section 9. Section 9 prohibits the take of any endangered species by any person. It only applies to endangered species, but by regulation, they've also extended it to threatened species. What does it mean to take? Well, it's a very, very broad definition. Uh, harass, harm, pursue, hunt, shoot, wound, kill, trap, capture, collect. You get the idea. You think about it bad, you're, 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 you're taking it. Call it a dirty name. Exactly. Call it a dirty name. Um, uh, harm, there's two, uh, two um, uh, aspects of the take definition that have gotten some more attention. One is harm. And harm is an act which actually kills or injures wildlife, and it also may include modifying its habitat. So if you cut down the tree where the spotted owl lives, that is a take of the spotted owl. That was challenged and upheld in a, um, uh, the seminal decision the Supreme Court called Babbitt v. Sweet Home in 1995. Alteration of a listed species habitat is, called a t is also considered a taking of that species. Pretty, pretty strict stuff. Um, another one that's been hotly disputed is harass which is an intentional or a negligent act or omission which creates likelihood of injury to the wildlife. And basically it's an annoyance. You don't even have to you know, kill it. You don't have to take its eggs. You don't have to threaten its, its survival. Um, if, you, if you bother it, you make it, you know, you flush it, you, uh, you make it fly away, um, that can be harassment. It can be deemed harassment. And, and projects we know have noise impacts. They have visual impacts. Um, so any of these can, uh, can, can get you into the, the prohibited take. I'll just I'll mention yeah. you know, that on the harassment one, that, that issue often comes up because, as Jimmy pointed out, you know people will try and design a project in a way to avoid, you know, critical habitat or designated habitat, um, and then you get into these proximity issues, yes, right? So exactly. okay, you know your line is over here, but you're building you know thousands of feet of, of commercial space not so far away, you know that's how harass comes into play. I always just thought it was the funniest word to sort of like, you know, imagine people out there like, you know getting into the brains of these fuzzy that's animals, right. you know, that's really not what it's about, right? It's the, it's, it, it's a harassed concept is, you know, what do you, what, what activity is likely to have some impact short of actually physically taking something? Exactly. Right. Well, well put. Um, so, and, and one other thing I want to take, which, which isn't fully appreciated, plants not covered by the take prohibition. An endangered plant on federal land not and and on and on private land it's 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 not it's not covered okay one exception um if i'm sorry if it is on federal land um it, it can be covered uh, to an extent and but only to the extent that it uh it violates um uh, the state law so plants are afforded less take protection than wildlife fishing um, than animals but that has not stopped the agency um from aggressively stopping take of plants as well uh so just to kind of put a question out there based on on what we've seen so far you know why might it be just a bad thing to simply say do not take endangered species and if you do you're liable 
any I mean any ideas. I mean, we're trying to protect species. We say you pr you, you take them, you're in trouble. What's 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 the problem? Yeah. Right. So you have the innocence problem that people are. It's a strict liability statute, and um, uh, exactly. But what's another? What's another possible unintended consequence? Say I don't know that there's an endangered species, but I don't want there to be an endangered species on my land. What might I do? Let's say I got some great habitat, which would be great for this endangered salamander. But I don't, if I know if a salamander comes on my land and I get designated habitat or species, I'm in trouble. What am I going to do? You can just kill it all. Yeah, you just kill it. You're, just, you're, gonna, you're not going to preserve your land for the benefit of the species. So basically, it's an adverse incentive. It's a perverse incentive to not maintain or conserve land um, for the benefit of the species. You have a lot of development for the sake of development because you just, you're just scared to death that that species will walk onto your land. Um, also, it prevents a lot of beneficial development. So we're not just talking about projects, but also federal, again, we're talking about federal agency actions, flood control, fire prevention. You, you, you can't build a road to get to, um, you know, the interior of a forest that, you know, is a lot of wildfire because there's, it's, it's the home of, of an endangered species. So this inflexibility really became a problem uh, in the early years of the Endangered Species Act, and Congress responded and put in Section 10, which allows you to take sometimes. So incidental take statement uh, will allow an agency to take uh, when it's short of jeopardy. But what about the private folks? So on non-federal lands, you can get an incidental take permit, and or otherwise known as an ITP, and basically like an ITS exonerates you uh, from liability under the Endangered Species Act as long as the taking is incidental to and not the purpose of the carrying out of the authorized activity. You cannot go, you cannot be intending uh, to go uh, take the species, but if, you know, you'd have to crack a few eggs along the way, bad analogy, um, that is not going to uh, create um, liability for you. There is one exception uh, uh, under scientific, you can have, um, you know, how do we study these species if we can't take them? There's been some uh, you know, how can scientists touch the species any more than um, a developer can? There's been uh, exemptions to take a species for the intent of taking the species, but for scientific purposes. Um, that's also under Section 10. So, you know, how, how do you get one of these great, you know, ITPs? Well, you have to apply, and you also have to come in with what's called a Habitat Conservation Plan, or an HCP. And the Habitat Conservation Plan has to look at the likely impact of your incidental taking, the steps you're going to minimize or mitigate the impact. So at this point, you can't avoid them, but what are we going to do to make them as small as possible? Uh, how are we going to ensure there's funding to implement the steps? And and what alternatives, you know, do we consider moving uh, the the right of way or the the, the project um, somewhere else and just found that it wasn't able to do, that we were unable to do that? A very, uh, a couple important things. One, the applicant for the project prepares and submits the proposed conservation plan and the species that they intend to cover. Okay, it's done in coordination with Fish, Fish and Wildlife Service, but the original um, ask comes from the applicant. Uh, it's Fish and Wildlife Service policy for there to be regional and multi-species plans. That's not binding, but if you want the best relationship with your regulator, you're going you're gonna to cover species that are going to be impacted. One other key thing, which goes right back to what, what Shiraz was saying, the incidental take permit does not authorize the actual project. It does not. All it does is say that you may un you may undertake the incidental take, and that's it. Um, that really matters for whether we trigger NEPA and how much NEPA. So a lot of um, these projects, if you, if I need to. Uh, take a, a fraction of a designated um, critical habitat um, to put my road in. Uh, I, I will um, need to do, and I don't think, and I don't need any other federal funding, any other federal approval or anything. The NEPA, we'll get to this next, the NEPA will have to cover the incidental take permit, but not the underlying project. And there's a lot of fight, a lot of differences in the legal world about how broad it has to be, but again, it, the agency itself has said that the incidental take permit does not authorize the project just the date. Um, in, in, um, uh, I will just point out a couple things on incidental take permit. One, there's something called the no surprises policy. So in order to, um, to, to get 
these types of plans and encourage people to get under conservation plans. Uh, there's basically a policy that if your efforts, okay, you comply with the terms of your habitat conservation plan, you do the measures you commit to, and let's say they turn out to be ineffective, okay, you do not have to do anything else. The government cannot make you do anything else, cannot say, whoops, you know, found that that mitigation measure not really effective, we think you should do something at twice the cost. If you're under, if you, that, that's called the no surprises policy, so it encourages people to get in on the front end. Um, there's also safe har harbor agreements for listed species. Let's say you don't have a project, but you want to engage, um, uh, you want to manage your land in a certain way that's going to protect the species, and then the species comes onto your land, or new information comes out with the species uh, about the species, you, you will not uh, be required to do more uh, on your land uh, under the safe harbor. There's been a, um, in 2006, the Fish and Wildlife Service came out with a, a twist on this called the General Conservation Plan, not HCP, but GCP. And these have, uh, there's not been one that has been fully completed and litigated yet, but this is, um, and one of our projects uh, has to do with this with a, a little critter we're going to see a picture of in a minute called the American Burying Beetle. Um, these are intended to be designed by the agency and they're basically the agency saying, look, we're sick of getting these individual HCPs, they're overlapped, takes a really long time, we want a little more control over the process, so we'll do it. We'll do a general conservation plan, it'll cover a lot of species and it'll allow basically anybody covered to get an incidental take permit under the GCP. Well intentioned, not working, <laughs> in my humble opinion, not working so far in practice, because basically it's allowed the entire process to go uh, uh, internal, um, and has resulted in a lot of asks uh, that may or may not be um, uh, c comport with the with the provisions of the act. James, as I understand it, to some degree, that provision was responding to the difficulty in getting these the MSHCPs, right? Yes. Multi-species conservation plans, because you were cutting across multi-jurisdictions. Right. You know, I know in California, for example, um, umbrella HCP they were called. That's yeah. right. Yeah. You know, you'll have some cities agree to the to the terms. Um, but other cities don't like where the habitat lines are drawn, and, right. and so they haven't been able to really effectuate that through these multi-jurisdictions. And the feds essentially said, fine, then we'll just deal with it. You right. know, if we can't get the local agencies to agree, we'll deal with it, but they haven't really made, right? I, I think there's only been a there, there's been, problems. Yeah, there, there, there's been, there's just been some, some issues in, in, in implementation. Um, again, as it depends on who's doing the GCP, you have different regions that have different ideas uh, on different, and so, it, you know, getting people on the same page can be difficult. Um, what happens to you? you know, we just violated the Endangered Species Act. I just thought about killing a snow owl. So, you know, it's, it's a spotted owl. So, you know, what, 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 what happens? Well, um, again, going back to sort of common law, it's a strict liability statute. You take it. It doesn't matter. There's no intent. You can be charged. Uh, the fines are low, about $500 for violation for the lowest civil penalties. As it becomes more knowing and intentional, they accelerate to $25,000, and then there could be even criminal penalties and jail time um, for, t for taking species. Let's say the government's being lax, and I, I'm a concerned citizen, and I, I just, you know, this, this species might, means a lot to me, and I want to stop the project. Can I do anything about it? Yes. Endangered Species Act allows under Section 11G citizen suits. And you can bring the citizen suit for injunctive relief to stop the violation or to compel the agency to act. So either the, um, and typically the, um, the, uh, the action is against, uh, is, is brought against the, uh, the agency and uh, the, the project proponent will intervene. Um, very low uh, standing threshold can be brought uh, where the action is uh, to, to take place kind of interesting twist on this one theory uh, there was a case um, much there might be others but the one I'm thinking of is in the Ninth Circuit and it was in 2004 and the novel theory here was that uh, animals can bring endangered species act claims on behalf of themselves so the plaintiff were um, uh, dolphins and I think uh, you know other other marine um, uh, animals uh, district court said no Ninth Circuit said no and they said animals are the protected rather than the protectors. So while it says any person can bring suit, person is not the giant panda. Uh, you have to give 60 days notice of, uh, of an intent to sue, which is intended to cure the violation before we have full-blown mitigation. And if the federal government does choose to get involved, the citizen suit has to give way. Okay. We got species out there that are not yet listed, but are on their way. What happens to them in the meantime? 
Well, there's two groups, proposed and candidate. So again, species must be listed as at least proposed for listing to fall within the ESA protections. If you're unlisted, you don't fall in within the, the letter of the law for the ESA. So again, the problem with waiting for them to just be listed is that's not really in the intent of the Endangered Species Act. Let's not wait until there's actual problem before we address it. Let's see what species are in trouble and try to see what we can do to address them early. And how, and how long can that listing process take? Uh, it can take years. Uh, it, it, it can take years, and, and um, especially with that warranted but precluded, it just basically recycles on itself. Um, we'll get to this, but uh, there have been recent settlements for uh, the 200, 300 you know, species that are sitting there for there to be end dates to reduce the backlog. Um, uh, these have been um, a reach between uh, environmental NGOs and the Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Marine Fishery Service uh, between 2015 2016, supposed to be on a rolling basis, but now there's hard deadlines. But a lot of the litigation has been brought because they haven't been listed in time, and we just, you know, inaction, failure to act um, under the, what we just said, failure to, you know, to, to compel agency action. Um, so, again, you. With, with proposed species, these are species that have been listed in the Federal Register. We decided that they should be endangered and it's warranted and we propose them for listing and they will be listed within 12 months. What happens to them in the interim? You can take them, but you can't commit, you can't uh, create jeopardy. And that it's an, a, another, just another inane way, it's, it's the, the statute's worded, you have a conference, not consultation, but a conference with the agencies, uh, Fish and Wildlife, which is uh, a little bit less, a uh, little bit less formal, but the same basic idea. Let's talk about the, what we're gonna do before we, uh, before we do it. Um, candidate species um, are those for which Fish and Wildlife has enough information, but again, the other things, we have higher priorities, the warranted but precluded. They have no protection uh, until they're listed under the Endangered Species Act, but it's been Fish and Wildlife policy to treat them as if they were proposed when evaluating a habitat conservation plan or an incidental take permit. So they, they will uh, rear their heads and be um, problems for you uh, in, their, in their project. Um, to, you know, to your question, I think they, they, a species can be found uh, 19 to 20 years uh, on the uh, candidate list. And of course, some on the candidate list have gone extinct uh, before the ESA, uh, before, they, before they've been listed. That's obviously not a good result. Um, Kind of similar to no surprises is uh, same type of incentives are created for unlisted species. So if you are willing in your incidental take permit to not just cover the listed species, but also cover these three that are candidate species, if and when they are listed, we won't come after you. We won't require anything further from you. So that's a, uh, an incentive to, uh, to, to get them in. And basically it's a take permit that's dormant until take becomes relevant when they're when they're listed. Um, these types of uh, agreements have taken two forms. One is a conservation uh, candidate conservation agreement. Um, they're voluntary and they address concerns by landowners about having a listed species on their land. Um, and you basically voluntarily commit specific actions to benefit the species. Um, if you want assurances, you have a con candidate conservation agreement with assurances. And that's for owners of non-federal lands and Fish and Wildlife Service and provides an assurance of no future asked by the government without consent. They're very related entities and I'm running out of time, so I don't want to go into them too much. But the idea is, again, we have agreements by landowners. Now, these have been used more and more as a uh, substitute for listing. The argument from the regulated community and industry is that if we have a lot of these CCAs and CCAAs, we don't need to list the species because they're basically being protected in a more smarter way, uh, more smarter, great, and it's more in a smarter way. Um, but sometimes there is no substitute to the listing. And again, you have to commit, you have to uh, convince the regulator. And if you're in a lawsuit, you gotta convince the judge too. Um, there's a programmatic option where you can have a, uh, a, uh, an agreement, a candidate conservation agreement agreed to um, uh, by, um, uh, by a, a, a state or um, a locality uh, and basically can have uh, that uh, through certificates of inclusion have individual projects and, um, and entities uh, encompassed under that. Um, so, see enough words. This is one guy I mentioned uh, that's currently dominating uh, the industry, kind of gives a concrete example. This guy is listed and endangered. This is the American burying beetle. Um, it, it's, it's very interesting. It feeds and breeds on carrion, which is a fancy way of saying dead animals. 
it basically buries them for overwintering. And it, one thing that really does that's kind of cool in the insect world is it, is it uh, displays parental care. So basically the, the, the two parents will stay um, with their eggs in the carrion until, uh, until they hatch. Um, these things are uh, prevalent in Oklahoma and Nebraska around that area. Um, also, they're in, uh, in one spot in Rhode Island where, where I got married, but I found out afterwards. Um, so that was uh, uh, yeah, interesting. Um, <laughs> uh, this is uh, it's currently subject to a general conservation plan, which I was meant, uh, um, uh, talking about. The agency is very optimistic that we'll have that done this year, but there's a lot of reasons why that won't happen. Um, this, this beetle is also implicated in the Keystone Pipeline, and there's been um, already litigation brought about uh, uh, how and, and um, what ways you can protect the beetle. Uh, another uh, interesting one is Gunnison sage grouse. Um, it's about one third of the size of the greater sage grouse, which we're going to talk about in a second. Um, this thing is totally dependent on sagebrush dominated habitats. This is one of those entities where, yes, you know, its, its habitat has been reduced um, by commercialization uh, over time, but the critical habitat is really the big thing here. It's proposed as endangered with critical habitat. So it's not yet there, but what that final critical habitat is going to look like is going to have a huge impact on what type of development um, is going to happen and, and what and, and, and where and when uh, that can happen. Uh, another one in the, in the news, the lesser prairie chicken, um, also sort of in that area, Oklahoma, Texas, New Mexico, Colorado, also depends on sagebrush habitat. Uh, there have been several uh, candidate conservation agreements that are in place for this, uh, for this species, but the agency has determined that they are not sufficient and they are looking very hard. It's been proposed as threatened. A lot of efforts by states and by industry to keep this thing off of the endangered species list and to protect it in other ways. What's going to happen? you got to wait and see. Greater sage grouse looks a lot like the other one. Um, this is the largest sage grouse in North America. Um, you know, it's known very elaborate courtship rituals uh, dependent on the sagebrush. Its habitat is becoming very fragmented, again, by um, various types of development. Uh, this thing has been through uh, a few iterations of litigation so far. Um, there was first a petition uh, to, to list it. Uh, it, was, it was denied, and that was overturned as arbitrary and capricious because it wasn't based on, quote, the best science. That's what the court found. That's called the Western, Water, Western Watersheds Project, the Fish and Wildlife. Um, on remand, uh, there was another determination made that it was warranted but precluded, and that was upheld in subsequent litigation, but pending the agency's commitment to complete its review by the end of 2015. If and when that 2015 deadline passes and nothing happens, we we'll see more litigation. Um, there's an, a, a recent report that was issued by um, uh, U.S. Geological Survey summarizing the science um, uh, about the sage grouse. Uh, you talk to any developer in the West, this is number one on their list. Uh, last one I'll talk it's about. List. It's a West. very, very long list. Um, this, this little guy is the, the sand dude lizard. Obviously, his advantage is, uh, is blending in with his environment. Um, he is a candidate species, and there is a candidate conservation agreement in place. There's a very small habitat in uh, New Mexico and Texas. It actually has the second smallest range of all lizards in the United States. Now, that was actually a good thing in making this happen because we were able to reach agreement on uh, efforts through conservation to protect it without listing it. But again, when you have that really widespread, you know, covering states, um, uh, that can be a little bit harder. Again, all these species uh, have the potential to significantly interfere with development activities, and they're looking at alternatives to listing while they're um, being considered for listing. Here's a mind bender. Do we have to do NEPA for our listing decisions or our other decisions under the Endangered Species Act? Who thinks yes? Who thinks no? And when I'm talking uh, to clarify the question, Fish and Wildlife wants to list or take an action to protect the species. Is that decision subject to NEPA? And for everybody who wants to abstain, you're all correct because we don't know. Um, the listing decision uh, has been found um, by a couple courts not to be subject to NEPA, the Sixth Circuit, but that's not binding uh, on uh, across the country. Pacific Legal Foundation v. Andrews found that the listing decision, uh, decision under Section 4 is not subject to NEPA. So basically, because it's based on biological factors, it's meant to improve the environment. We don't need to evaluate its uh, um, its uh, its impacts under NEPA, but there's a conflict between the Ninth and Tenth Circuits about whether designation of critical habitat is subject to NEPA. 
the Ninth Circuit has said no, and the Tenth Circuit has said yes. And the idea is whether one, whether the Endangered Species Act really displaces the NEPA concerns, or is there just some sort of overlap? Um, again, talking about not just whether it's triggered, but the scope of the action, uh, as I mentioned before, you have to look at what what is the proposed action? Is it authorizing the highway, or is it authorizing the incidental take? And that will help guide um, what the uh, scope of the NEPA is if and when it's triggered. Um, NEPA, uh, the ESA is not the only game in town. Um, a few of these have uh, um, uh, preceded the ESA, and they've been uh, amended uh, since. The earliest one we had is the Lacey Act, which prevents trade in um, uh, products that are uh, um, derived from from endangered and threatened species. That's from uh, from 1900, and then it was significantly expanded in 1969. Uh, that's a very important uh, uh, very important measure to deter uh, taking an exotic species that has a uh, you know a valuable uh, body part um, that's uh, you know wants to be used for commercial purposes. The Migratory Bird Treaty Act that is later in 1929. It's a criminal statute. It's a strict liability criminal statute, and you cannot take migratory birds, whether they're listed or unlisted. Migratory birds are really broad, eagles, uh, the whooping crane, um, and, and these, this really rears its head uh, and, and as to how consistent it is um, with the Endangered Species Act. There is no incidental take that's authorized under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, unlike the Endangered Species Act. However, um, there have been uh, things called special purpose permits that have been allowed uh, given uh, in individual projects um, to allow uh, incidental takings of migratory birds. But basically, it's just been prosecutorial discretion by the agencies. Um, you, you know, you can have any kind of impact on a bird. Close your door and it flies into your house and dies. Do you have a criminal violation? By the letter of the law, probably. But obviously, it hasn't all been enforced. Uh, Bald Eagle Protection Act of 1940 came after that. Um, that was specialized, obviously, on bald eagles, also a criminal statute, also uh, strict liability, but there have been um, regulations, unlike the MBTA, there have been regulations under the Bald Eagle uh, Act that basically allows incidental take in conjunction um, with, a, with an ESA uh, Section 10 permit. Um, and there's a, a bunch of other ones, and also I don't want to overlook the, the states. The states all have a subset of laws. There may be uh, a, a certain flower, a certain toad, that doesn't qualify for federal protection, but it does for the state. And you will have to uh, engage with the state wildlife agency and um, comply with their um, their regulations before you proceed. Also, going global. So the Lacey Act, um, similarly motivated is the is CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. Okay, and that's an international agreement between governments, and it basically uh, stops international trade between um, specimens of wild animals and plants. The U.S. is a signatory to that, as well as 178 other countries. Um, there's the U.N. Uh, Convention on Biological Diversity that recognizes uh, biodiversity as a value in itself and requires uh, their member countries to take steps to protect um, to protect species in their country. The U.S. is not a member uh, of that convention. And then we have various migratory bird treaties that were encapsulated by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act that we just talked about. Those bird treaties are international in scope. And there's various other treaties, like whaling treaties. You know, 1946 International Convention for Regulation of Whaling. Um, a big controversy of countries that are really interested in preserving whales and countries that rely on whales for subsidence, um, you know, for food and other purposes. In a minute, just talk about some hot issues going forward. Um, obviously, some key listing decisions. We went through some of them, but there's going to be uh, a bunch coming down the pike. Some of them that are going to be, uh, you know, guy, uh, governed by that settlement uh, addressing the backlog. There's been a phenomenon lately called sue and settle, where, and that's sort of how this uh, this giant um, you know, overall agreement came to be. Where basically you sue Fish and Wildlife for not undertaking action to uh, to, to take action or on the listing decision or to uh, you sue them um, uh, um, for for not uh, uh, not implement, implementing a certain kind of conservation plan, and you basically have a settlement that's approved by the judge, and through that settlement, the agency agrees to take certain action. That's done behind closed doors. It's not done through regular rulemaking. There have been some uh, bills in Congress that have been aimed to address this phenomenon, but it's been a creative a litigation tactic. But uh, there are some 
uh, definite problems with it. Specific projects, uh, you know, after Deepwater Horizon, um, the, uh, when I do a lot of offshore um, uh, energy work. Uh, one thing that that's being looked at right now is offshore seismic exploration. When we're looking for oil and gas um, reservoirs, and they they do certain uh, testing, basically sound waves, how they bounce back up because some of these things are miles down. Uh, does that uh, does that sound testing impact uh, endangered uh, sea life um, uh, in the area? Offshore wind farms. Um, you know, this has been sort of where environmentalists have been at. It. You know, we like clean energy, but we also don't like birds being, you know, their heads cut off by spinning turbines. So, you know, what, you know, what do we, is it avoidable? And at some point, do we allow certain incidental take um, for the benefit of, um, of, of alternatives, uh, alternative energy? Um, and then, of course, you know, legislative reforms, there's a, you know, a working group right now, I think there's been one in every Congress looking at what we can do to uh, amend the act, it, it's, it has, you know, it's outdated, you know, needs certain clarifications rather than let it be done through the courts or on a case by case basis, but, uh, you know, don't hold your breath. Um, I think that is all I have. So, we have a minute if anybody has any ESA questions. I know it's crystal clear. Sure. Okay. Um, we have an internet question concerning Section 7. Question asks, does most litigation arise when Fish Wildlife Service uh, call jeopardy on a project or during the consultation leading up to the take statement, biological opinion, mostly regarding mitigation measures or decision? Um, I'll just finish reading this and then I'll still it. Um, what do you deal with when projects get to your desk regarding potential lawsuits regarding Section 7? Just curious to how you work, mostly concerning the Section 7 process when applicants come to you. Hope this is clear since I'm listening on the phone. Um, I think the general question, how, how, do, we, how do we proceed um, uh, under Section 7? Uh, well, the first thing that, that we advise our clients to do is to uh, determine what their uh, area of potential impact is going to be. Uh, can you avoid uh, an area where we know uh, endangered species that are critical habitat are going to be. Uh, if yes, great, let's go ahead and do it. Uh, if we can't, then we engage very early on, um, and partly because a lot of these projects have meant multiple phases and variables to them where the fish and wildlife approval is just one of many that we need. So uh, there will be a cooperating agency uh, in the NEPA process, and we will begin Section 7 consultation with them um, fairly early on. It's never wrong. To engage the agency. If you engage the agency um, and uh, it turns out you're not going to have an effect, it's not like you get put into uh, another box. The, the safer course is always to uh, to engage early um, and, and to engage often. Um, where the litigation actually happens um, is, is in the context of when the project gets approved and you have a, um, a challenge to the project for failure. It can be procedural or substantive. One, failure to consult. So it's, you know, we, you just didn't do the Section 7 process. That's a really easy one uh, to show uh, in the administrative record, and you can kick back on that ground alone. The other one's substantive. Yeah, you found, you, know, you did the consultation, you found no, uh, not likely to adversely impact, uh, but that's arbitrary and capricious because here's nine studies that say you are going to have it. And basically, you'll have deference to the agency at that point, but it has to be that kind of dialogue and that kind of record support. Yeah, no, I was, was going to say, and, and you know, our, our job is often helping the clients you know, build that record. Yes. You didn't talk too much about surveys, but that's yes, you know, they, where, where a lot of the, um, you know, the science side of, of species work is looking at what's out there and how do you determine it. And uh, you sometimes see, you know, interesting results. I mean, out in California desert where you see sage scrub indicating that, you know, millions of years ago you had, you know, underwater territory and trying to convince developers in the desert that they have to worry about species and um, can be really challenging. But that's, that, that is where the litigation comes up. Yeah, that, that's right. And, 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 and even more, you know, drilled down on that is how you do them. I mean, you know, we, I, I did nine surveys. I didn't find, I didn't find the species. Did you do? Did you do it the tenth way? Did you, did you bring? Right. Did you bring dogs out? Did you? Did you bring uh, the time you know, of year? The time of the, year. Did yeah. you do it when they're most you know most active? Um, and so it, that that often is 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 litigated. The, the agency will get deference on that, but there needs to be a uh, a clear strategy and clear um, uh, you know modus operandi uh, before you can uh, ask for ask for that deference. I hope I answered the question. Um, on the phone. Any others on the phone or here? Yeah. So you were just talking about the surveys, which is the question I had. Like, so when you're 
you know, coming up with the projects, how is it that you're going to figure out whether or not there is an endangered species on that particular plot of land? Yeah, um, there, there is a database uh, on Fish and Wildlife that you go to first. Um, they list uh, all areas and uh, by, by field office uh, what, um, what uh, species are, are implicated and where the, the relevant habitat is. So that, that would be your first match of your uh, geographic scope of your project um, with that. And then um, usually state and local equivalents as yes, well. Yes, exactly, state and local equivalents, right. Um, you would go uh, usually talk. Uh, to your Fish and Wildlife Service representative, are there any others? Uh, you know, these are the ones we got. You know, this is what we're going to look at. You know, okay. Um, and and you would, I come up with. I always think it's better to go in with a proposal. Say that you know, for instance, we um, you know one of our clients is building a pipeline um, in in Oklahoma, an oil and gas pipeline, and. Uh, uh, wanted to, you know, he had redirected it a few different ways, um, uh, in, in some case making it longer to avoid certain areas of concern. Um, you know, rather than come out and ask, what do you want us to do? Which there's a million things, you know, again, you're talking to scientists mostly at the, at the field office level who, you know, are more concerned with the, the species survival in your project. Um, but you uh, come in, with, you know, I, I proposed a survey for seven days, uh, during, you know, uh, on May 20th when the species comes out. Um, I'm going to do a seven continuous days of, of, of looking. I'm going to use this company that's certified to do it. Uh, if I don't find it in that period, then I'm going to determine that you know that it's not um, uh, that that it's it's not listed. Uh, you'll get concurrence uh, with that, so you get some comments on on how to do it. Without an incidental take permit, you don't have the immunity uh, if if by accident you take it. Um, but because, especially in this area of, of sequestration, it's not the agencies looking the other way, but th there are uh, avoidance measures um, and ways to do it, best practices, where you will be on solid ground, and there's ways to do it, you know, just kind of going forth. And what the agency focuses its enforcement actions on are the real bad actors um, that, that just, you know, operate without really a care um, uh, uh, if they're out there or not. So come up with a strategy, you know, work with counsel, um, you know, propose it, float it, they'll have some comments, revise it, uh, and, and, and go forth. Um, you know, even if you don't get that letter said, we will not sue you, uh, you will have a lot of confidence. Um, again, risk management, uh, you know, how can we, how can we reduce your risks? Actually, I'm going to end the session for a little bit um, beyond time. I just want to make sure that everybody has time to get back to where they're going. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much to Taraz and Jamie for um, teaching us today. <laughs> Thank you guys for having Thank me. Thank you. Thank you all.